October bringeth wine and birds, to net thy crops be sure. So wheat and palm, and loosen still the earth's bedewed moor. Preserve thine apples, till thy fields collect in all thine oats, and gather still the food in which come winter are thy hopes. We start off this month with St Paulinus, the first Bishop of York. Paulinus was described by Bede as a tall man with a slight stoop, who had black hair, a thin face, and a narrow aquiline nose, his presence being venerable and awe-inspiring. He was part of the original mission to the British Isles, which was sent by Pope Gregory and led by St Augustine. After staying around Canterbury for a time, he was consecrated bishop and sent north to the Northumbrians in order to lead a mission to their king, Egdwin. His legend tells us that he toiled much, but it came to very little. Eventually, however, Paulinus had a breakthrough and convinced the king to be baptised, which set a trend in motion and soon all of the nobility and influential people of the region were following suit. In order to cope with the converts, Paulinus built a church at York and at Lincoln. His legend goes on to tell us that following this success there was an uprising in Northumbria which ultimately meant that Paulinus had to flee back down south, where he took up the building of the church at Rochester in Kent. Despite the spin that Bede tries to put on his account, ultimately it seems that Paulinus, despite the best intentions, was not a particularly successful missionary, which I find humanises him a good deal, much more than some of the mighty missionary contemporaries. He has nevertheless left us an important legacy in York Minster, Lincoln Cathedral and Rochester Cathedral, so not nothing to show for his efforts after all. On the 12th, we have the Feast of St Wilfred of York, who is an interesting character. Wilfred is extremely well written about in contemporary sources, so we know a lot about his life. He was the son of a Northumbrian thane, but ran away from home at the age of 13 as a result of a falling out with his stepmother. He went first to the court of Oswy, then on to Lindisfarne and Whitby, where he studied the theology and customs of the Roman Church. Wilford travelled widely and accompanied his friend Benedict Biscop on his first journey to Rome, where he was made secretary to Pope Martin. When he returned to England, he was appointed the abbot of Ripon in order to instruct the Northumbrians in the proper uses of the Western Roman Church, and specifically to correct the customs which had arisen among the Celtic Christians, whom Wilfred had previously had a falling out with. Many people will have heard of the Synod of Whitby, which dealt with this problem and which he was one of the leading prelates of. After Whitby, Wilfred was appointed Bishop of Northumbria, but chose to go to Gaul to be consecrated because of a lack of validly ordained bishops in the north of England at the time. While Wilfred was away though, there seems to have been some political upset in Northumbria, which ultimately led to the question of his appointment, because he had a falling out with a new king. This dragged on for a long time, until eventually the Archbishop of Canterbury, Theodore of Tarsus, whom Wilfrid had also had a falling out with, but then made up with again, intervenes to allow Wilfrid's return. He died in 709 and was thereafter venerated as a saint. The pattern of Wilfrid's life is largely one of falling out with pretty much everyone he came in contact with, leading one historian to comment that Wilfrid came into conflict with almost every prominent secular and ecclesiastical figure of the age. Another, somewhat less charitable summation is that Wilfrid left a distinct mark on the character of the English church in the 7th century. He was not a humble man, nor, so far as we can see, was he greatly interested in learning, and perhaps he would have been more at home as a member of the Gallo-Roman Episcopate, where the wealth which gave him enemies in England would have passed unnoticed and where his interference in matters of state would have been less likely to take him to prison. On the 13th of this month, we have the feast of one of England's most significant saints, Edward the Confessor. Edward was the nephew of, and shouldn't be confused with, King Saint Edward the Martyr, from whom he inherited the kingship of Wessex. When he was 10 years old, the Danes, who were at that time rampaging through the south of England, tried to find him and kill him, but Edward was able to flee to the safety of Normandy to live with his uncle Richard, then the Duke. When the Danes had at last been driven away, Edward returned to Wessex and took over the reins of the kingdom, 
and began the rebuilding project, beginning with the monasteries and churches which had been ruined by the Vikingers. Because of his charity he earned the moniker Father of Orphans and Parents the Poor, and was never happier than when he spent on the needy. Edward had a particular devotion to St John the Evangelist, and it seems that he was in the habit of never refusing anything which was asked in St John's name. It is said that the evangelist appeared to him once while in tattered raiment, and in his own name asked for arms. It appeared that the king had no money with him, as everyone knows monarchs don't carry change, so Edward took off his ring and gave it as a gift. Not long afterward, the evangelist sent the ring back to Edward via a pilgrim, with a message concerning his death, thus founding the Royal Mail. His body, which is incorrupt, was translated to the church which he had built outside London, Westminster Abbey, where it still lies in a shrine behind the high altar. A little known fact about Edward the Confessor is that before the adoption of St George he was considered to be the patron saint of England, but not, I think, the patron saint of good marital relationships. Contemporary sources tell us that Edward had some problems fathering an heir, and was considering divorce from his wife Edith. It was only the looming threat of Edith's influential family which prevented him. Luckily for Edward though, Edith's father and brothers were driven into exile, and Edward took the opportunity to essentially imprison Edith in a nunnery. We're not sure exactly how Edith took to this, but she was clearly an indomitable woman, because she managed to fight her way out of the nunnery and back to the royal court and regained her rightful position as queen, much to Edward's dismay. In any case, she clearly forgave her husband for this momentary indiscretion, and in her latter years became one of the chief proponents of Edward's cult of sanctity, choosing to be buried next to him in Westminster Abbey. On the 19th, we have the feast of another indomitable Saxon woman, St. Frieswede. Frieswede was the daughter of a king called Didan, and his wife, Safrida. She was obviously quite a pious child, because the records tell us that she founded a monastery with the help of her dad when she was still young. Unfortunately, her parents were to die while she was still a young woman, and a man called Algar, the King of Mercia, tried to marry her despite her having taken a vow of celibacy. Eventually, Algar became predatory, and Frieswede had to run away after he tried to abduct her. Thankfully, however, God supplied her with a ship which took her to Bampton in Oxfordshire. Algar, infuriated, rode after her and searched every house in Oxford for his bride-in-waiting. Thankfully, though, the people of Oxford banded together and refused to give away Frieswede's hideout, and Algar was struck with that perennial doom which seems to visit all uppity Saxon kings when they try to abduct holy women as their wives. He was struck blind. Frieswede, now safe, moved down the road to Binzi, where she set up a house for herself a little way up from the River Thames. She later regretted the distance which she had to travel to fetch water from the river, though, and prayed to God for some solution to the problem, who obliged by causing a spring of water to come out of the ground near her house. The spring has a reputation as a place of healing, and you can still go and visit it today. She later moved into Oxford proper, where she founded a priory of Augustinian canons, which later came to be Christ Church Cathedral, the central foundation of Christ Church Oxford, making Frieswede the patroness of Oxford University. Skipping over the feast of the 11 billion virgins on the 21st, we hit St Crispin's Day, who, as we all know, is most famous for his jackpot liturgical product placement in the Kenneth Brawner feature documentary Henry V. This day is called the Feast of Crispian. He that outlives this day and comes safe home will stand at tiptoe when this day is named and arouse him at the name of Crispian. He that shall see this day and live old age will yearly, on the vigil, feast his neighbors and say, tomorrow is St. Crispin's. Then will he strip his sleeve and show his scars and say, these wounds I had on Crispin's day. Old men forget, yet all shall be forgot, but he'll remember with advantages what feats he did that day. Then shall our names, familiar in their mouths as household words, Harry the King, Bedford and Exeter, 
Warwick and Talbot, Salisbury and Gloucester be in their flowing cups freshly remembered. This story shall the good man teach his son, and Crispin Crispian shall ne'er go by from this day to the ending of the world. But we in it shall be remembered. We few. We happy few. We band of brothers. For he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. Be he ne'er so vile, this day shall gentle his condition. And gentlemen in England, now abed, shall think themselves a curse they were not here and hold their manhoods cheap whilst any speaks that thought with us upon St. Crispin's Day! And so another month comes to a close. Until next month, beloved listener, may St. Paulinus and Wilfred, the beacons of the North and adornments of the English Church, fight our cause in the face of the foe. May St. Edward, the King and Confessor, St. Frieda's Weed, the Lady of Oxford, and all our royal English patrons pray for their people in that greater court of the Heavenly King, now and forever. Amen.